miss kelman's egg and her precious leg six by thomas hood her marriage two hundred and nineteen twas morn a most auspicious one from the golden east the golden sun came forth his glorious race to run through clouds of most splendid tinges clouds that lately slept in shade but now seemed made of gold brocade with magnificent golden fringes two hundred and twenty gold above and gold below the earth reflected the golden glow from river and hill and valley gilt by the golden light of morn the thames it looked like the golden horn and the barge that carried coal or corn like cleopatra's galley 221 bright as clusters of golden rod suburban poplars began to nod with extempore splendor furnished while london was bright with glittering clocks golden dragons and golden cocks and above them all the dome of st paul with its golden cross and its golden ball shone out as if newly burnished two hundred and twenty two and lo for golden hours and joys troops of glittering golden boys danced along with a jocund noise and their gilded emblems carried in short twas the year's most golden day by mortals called the first of may when miss kilmanseg of the golden leg with a golden ring was married two hundred and twenty three and thousands of children women and men counted the clock from eight till ten from st james's sonorous steeple for next to that interesting job the hanging of jack or bill or bob there's nothing so draws a london mob as the noosing of very rich people 224 and a treat it was for the mob to behold the bridal carriage that blazed with gold and the footmen tall and the coachman bold in liveries so resplendent coats you wondered to see in place they seemed so rich with golden lace that they might have been independent 225 coats that made those menials proud gaze with scorn on the dingy crowd from their gilded elevations not to forget that saucy lad ostentation's favourite cad the page who looked so splendidly clad like a page of the wealth of nations two hundred and twenty six but the coachman carried off the state with what was a lancashire body of late turned into a dresden figure with a bridal nosegay of early bloom about the size of a birchen broom and so huge a white favour had gog been groom he need not have worn a bigger two hundred and twenty seven and then to see the groom the count with foreign orders to such an amount and whiskers so wild nay bestial he seemed to have borrowed the shaggy hair as well as the stars of the polar bear to make him look celestial two hundred and twenty eight and then great jove the struggle the crush the screams the heaving the awful rush the swearing the tearing and fighting the hats and bonnets smashed like an egg to catch a glimpse of the golden leg which between the steps and miss kilman's egg was fully displayed in alighting two hundred and twenty nine from the golden ankle up to the knee there it was for the mob to see a shocking act had it chanced to be a crooked leg or a skinny but although a magnificent veil she wore such as never was seen before in case of blushes she blushed no more than george the first on a guinea 230 another step and lo she was launched all in white as brides are blanched with a wreath of most wonderful splendor diamonds and pearls so rich in device that according to calculation nice her head was worth as royal a price as the head of the young pretender 231 bravely she shone and shone the more as she sailed through the crowd of squalid and poor thief beggar and tattered amalian led by the count with his slow black eyes bright with triumph and some surprise like anson on making sure of his prize the famous mexican galleon 232 anon came lady k with her face quite made up to act with grace but she cut the performance shorter for instead of pacing stately and stiff at the stair of the vulgar she took a miff and ran full speed into church as if to get married before her daughter two hundred and thirty three but sir jacob walked more slowly and bowed right and left to the gaping crowd wherever a glance was seizable for sir jacob thought he bowed like a guelph 
and therefore bowed to imp and elf and would gladly have made a bow to himself had such a bow been feasible 234 and last and not the least of the sight six handsome fortunes all in white came to help in the marriage rite and rehearse their own hymeneals and then the bright procession to close they were followed by just as many bows quite fine enough for ideals 235 glittering men and splendid dames thus they entered the porch of st james pursued by a thunder of laughter for the beadle was forced to intervene for jim the crow and his mayday queen with her gilded ladle and jackie the green would fain have followed after 236 beadle like he hushed the shouts but the temple was full inside and out and a buzz kept buzzing all round about like bees when the day is sunny a buzz universal that interfered with the rite that ought to have been revered as if the couple already was smeared with wedlock's treacle and honey 237 yet wedlock's a very awful thing tis something like that feat in the ring which requires good nerve to do it when one of a grand equestrian troop makes a jump at a gilded hoop not certain at all of what may befall after his getting through it 338 but the count he felt the nervous work no more than any polygamous turk or bold piratical skipper who during his buccaneering search would as soon engage a hand in church as a hand on board his clipper 239 and how did the bride perform her part like any bride who is cold at heart mere snow with the ices glitter but what a life of winter for her bright but chilly alive without stir so splendidly comfortless just like a fir when the frost is severe and bitter 240 such were the future man and wife whose bale or bliss to the end of life a few short words were to settle wilt thou have this woman i will and then wilt thou have this man i will and amen and those two were one flesh in the angel's ken except one leg that was metal 241 then the names were signed and kissed the kiss and the bride who came from her coach a miss as a countess walked to her carriage whilst hymen preened his plumes like a dove and cupid fluttered his wings above in the shape of a fly as little a love as ever looked in at a marriage 242 another crash and away they dashed and the gilded carriage and footmen flashed from the eyes of the gaping people who turned to gaze at the toe and heel of the golden boys beginning a reel to the merry sound of a wedding peal from st james's musical steeple 243 those wedding bells those wedding bells how sweetly they sound in pastoral dells from a tower in an ivy green jacket but town made joys how dearly they cost and after all a tumbled and tossed like a peal from a london steeple and lost in town made riot and racket 244 the wedding peal how sweetly it peals with grass or heather beneath our heels for bells are music's laughter but a london peal well mingled be sure with vulgar noises and voices impure with a harsh and discordant overture to the harmony meant to come after 245 but hence with discord perchance too soon to cloud the face of the honeymoon with a dismal occultation whatever fate's concerted trick the countess and count at the present nick have a chicken and not a crow to pick at a sumptuous cold collation 246 a breakfast no unsubstantial mess but one in the style of good queen bess who hearty as hippocampus broke her fast with ale and beef instead of toast and the chinese leaf and in lieu of anchovy grampus 247 a breakfast of fowl and fish and flesh whatever was sweet or salt or fresh with wines the most rare and curious wines of the richest flavour and hue with fruits from the worlds both old and new and fruits obtained before they were due at a discount most usurious 258 for wealthy palates there be that scout what is in season for what is out and prefer all precocious savour for instance early green peas of the sort that costs some four or five guineas a quart where the mint is the principal flavour 259 
and many a wealthy man was there such as the wealthy city could spare to put in a portly appearance men whom their fathers had helped to gild and men who had had their fortunes to build and much to their credit had richly filled their purses by perseverance 250 men by popular rumour at least not the last to enjoy a feast and truly they were not idle luckier far than the chestnut tits which down at the door stood champing their bits at a different sort of bridal 251 for the time was come and the whiskered count helped his bride in the carriage to mount and fain would the muse deny it but the crowd including two butchers in blue the regular killing white chapel hue of her precious calf had as ample a view as if they had come to buy it 252 then away away with all the speed that golden spurs can give to the steed both yellow boys and guineas indeed concurred to urge the cattle away they went with favours white yellow jackets and panels bright and left the mob like a mob at night agape at the sound of a rattle 253 away away they rattled and rolled the count and his bride and her leg of gold that faded charm to the charmer away through old brentford rang the din of wheels and heels on their way to win that hill named after one of her kin the hill of the golden farmer 254 gold still gold it flew like dust it tipped the postboy and paid the trust in each open palm it was freely thrust there was nothing but giving and taking and if gold could ensure the future hour what hopes attended that bride to her bower but alas even hearts with a four horse power of opulence end in breaking her honeymoon 255 the moon the moon so silver and cold her fickle temper has oft been told now shady now bright and sunny but of all the lunar things that change the one that shows most fickle and strange and takes the most eccentric range is the moon so called of honey 256 to some a full-grown orb revealed as big and as round as norval's shield and as bright as a burner bued lighted to others as dull and dingy and damp as any oleaginous lamp of the regular old parochial stamp in a london fog benighted 257 to the loving a bright and constant sphere that makes earth's commonest things appear all poetic romantic and tender hanging with jewels a cabbage stump and investing a common post or a pump a currant bush or a gooseberry clump with a halo of dreamlike splendour 258 a sphere such as shone from italian skies in juliet's dear dark liquid eyes tipping trees with its argent braveries and to couples not favoured with fortune's boons one of the most delightful of moons for it brightens their pewter platters and spoons like a silver service of savouries 259 for all is bright and beauteous and clear and the meanest thing most precious and dear when the magic of love is present love that lends a sweetness and grace to the humblest spot and the plainest face that turns wilderness row into paradise place and garlic hill to mount pleasant 260 love that sweetens sugarless tea and makes contentment and joy agree with the coarsest boarding and bedding love that no golden ties can attach but nestles under the humblest thatch and will fly away from an emperor's match to dance at a penny wedding 261 oh happy happy thrice happy state when such a bright planet governs the fate of a pair of united lovers tis theirs in spite of the serpent's hiss to enjoy the pure primeval kiss with as much of the old original bliss as mortality ever recovers 262 there's strength in double joints no doubt in double x ale and dublin stout that the single sorts know nothing about and a fist is strongest when doubled and double aqua fortis of course and double soda water perforce are the strongest that ever bubbled 263 there's double beauty whenever a swan swims on a lake with her double thereon and ask the gardener luke or john of the beauty of double blowing 
a double dahlia delights the eye and it's far the loveliest sight in the sky when a double rainbow is glowing 264 there's warmth in a pair of double soles as well as a double allowance of coals in a coat that is double-breasted in double windows and double doors and a double yew wind is blessed by scores for its warmth to the tender chested 265 there's a twofold sweetness in double pipes and a double barrel and double snipes give the sportsman a duplicate pleasure there's double safety in double locks and double letters bring cash for the box and all the world knows that double knocks are gentility's double measure 265 there's a double sweetness in double rhymes and a double at whist and a double times in profit are certainly double by doubling the hare contrives to escape and all seamen delight in a doubled cape and a double reefed topsail in trouble 267 there's a double chuck at a double chin and of course there's a double pleasure therein if the parties were brought to telling and however our denizens take offence a double meaning shows double sense and if proverbs tell truth a double tooth is wisdom's adopted dwelling 268 but double wisdom and pleasure and sense beauty respect strength comfort and thence through whatever the list discovers they are all in the double blessedness summed of what was formerly doubled drummed the marriage of two true lovers 269 now the kilmanseg moon it must be told though instead of silver it tipped with gold shone rather wan and distant and cold and before its days were at thirty such gloomy clouds began to collect with an ominous ring of ill effect as gave but too much cause to expect such weather as seamen call dirty 270 and yet the moon was the young may moon and the scented hawthorn had blossomed soon and the thrush and the blackbird were singing the snow-white lambs were skipping in play and the bee was humming a tune all day to flowers as welcome as flowers in may and the trout in the stream was springing 271 but what were the hues of the blooming earth its scents its sounds or the music and mirth of its furred or its feathered creatures to a pair in the world's last sordid stage who had never looked into nature's page and had strange ideas of a golden age without any arcadian features 272 and what were joys of the pastoral kind to a bride town maid with a heart and a mind with simplicity ever at battle a bride of an ostentatious race who thrown in the golden farmer's place would have trimmed her shepherds with golden lace and gilt the horns of her cattle 273 she could not please the pigs with her whim and the sheep wouldn't cast their eyes at a limb for which she had been such a martyr the deer in the park and the colts at grass and the cows unheeded let it pass and the ass on the common was such an ass that he wouldn't have swapped the thistle he cropped for her leg including the garter 274 she hated lanes and she hated fields she hated all that the country yields and barely knew turnips from clover she hated walking in any shape and a country style was an awkward scrape without the bribe of a mob to gape at the leg in clambering over 275 o oh, blessed nature o oh, russ o oh, russ who cannot sigh for the country thus absorbed in a worldly torpor who does not yearn for its meadow sweet breath untainted by care and crime and death and to stand sometimes upon grass or heath that soul spite of gold is a pauper 276 but to hail the pearly advent of morn and relish the odour fresh from the thorn she was far too pampered a madam or to joy in the daylight waxing strong while after ages of sorrow and wrong the scorn of the proud the misrule of the strong and all the woes that to man belong the lark still carols the self-same song that he did to the uncursed adam 277 the lark she had given all leipzig's flocks for a vauxhall tune in a musical box and as for the birds in the thicket thrush or ousel in leafy niche the linnet or finch she was far too rich to care for a morning concert to which she was welcome without any ticket 278 
gold still gold her standard of old all pastoral joys were tried by gold or by fancies golden and cruel till ere she had passed one week unblessed as her agricultural uncle's guest her mind was made up and fully impressed that felicity could not be rural 279 and the count to the snow-white lambs at play and all the scents and the sights of may and the birds that warbled their passion his ears and dark eyes and decided nose were as deaf and as blind and as dull as those that overlook the bouquet de rose the huile antique the parfum unique in a barber's temple of fashion 280 to tell indeed the true extent of his rural bias so far it went as to covered estates in ring fences and for rural law he had learned in town that the country was green turned up with brown and garnished with trees that a man might cut down instead of his own expenses 281 and yet had that fault been his only one the pair might have had few quarrels or none for their tastes thus far were in common but faults he had that a haughty bride with a golden leg could hardly abide faults that would even have roused the pride of a far less mettlesome woman two hundred and eighty two it was early days indeed for a wife in the very spring of her married life to be chilled by its wintry weather but instead of sitting as lovebirds do on hymen's turtles that bill and coo enjoying their moon and honey for two they were scarcely seen together 283 in vain she sat with her precious leg a little exposed a la kilmanseg and rolled her eyes in their sockets he left her in spite of her tender regards and those loving murmurs described by bards for the rattling of dice and the shuffling of cards and the poking of balls into pockets 284 moreover he loved the deepest stake and the heaviest bets the players would make and he drank the reverse of sparely and he used strange curses that made her fret and when he played with herself at piquet she found to her cost for she always lost that the count did not count quite fairly 285 and then came dark mistrust and doubt gathered by worming his secrets out and slips in his conversations fears which all her peace destroyed that his title was null his coffers were void and his french chateau was in spain or enjoyed the most airy of situations two hundred and eighty six but still his heart if he had such a part she only she might possess his heart and hold his affections in fetters alas that hope like a crazy ship was forced its anchor and cable to slip when seduced by her fears she took a dip in his private papers and letters two hundred and eighty seven letters that told of dangerous leagues and notes that hinted as many intrigues as the counts in the barber of seville in short such mysteries came to light that the countess bride on the thirtieth night woke and started up in a fright and kicked and screamed with all her might and finally fainted away outright for she dreamt she had married the devil end of section seventy seven this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Kilmanseg and Her Precious Leg, Seven, by Thomas Hood. Her Misery, 288. Who hath not met with home-made bread, a heavy compound of putty and lead, and home-made wines that rack the head, and home-made liqueurs and waters? home-made pop that will not foam and home-made dishes that drive one from home not to name each mess for the face or dress home-made by the homely daughters two hundred and eighty nine home-made physic that sickens the sick thick for thin and thin for thick in short each homogeneous trick for poisoning domesticity and since our parents called the first a little family squabble nursed of all our evils the worst of the worst is home-made infelicity 290 there's a golden bird that claps its wings and dances for joy on its perch and sings with a persian exultation for the sun is shining into the room and brightens up the carpet bloom as if it were new brand new from the loom or the lone nun's fabrication 
291 and thence the glorious radiance flames on pictures in massy gilded frames enshrining however no painted dames but portraits of colts and fillies pictures hanging on walls which shine in spite of the bard's familiar line with clusters of gilded lilies ninety two and still the flooding sunlight shares its lustre with gilded sofas and chairs that shine as if freshly burnished and gilded tables with glittering stocks of gilded china and golden clocks toy and trinket and musical box that peace and paris have furnished ninety three and lo with the brightest gleam of all the glowing sunbeam is seen to fall on an object as rare as splendid the golden foot of the golden leg of the countess once miss kilmanseg but there all sunshine is ended ninety four her cheek is pale and her eye is dim and downward cast yet not at the limb once the centre of all speculation but downward dropping in comfort's dearth as gloomy thoughts are drawn to the earth whence human sorrows derive their birth by a moral gravitation ninety five her golden hair is out of its braids and her sighs betray the gloomy shades that her evil planet revolves in and tears are falling that catch a gleam so bright as they drop in the sunny beam that tears of aqua regia they seem the water that gold dissolves in two hundred and ninety six yet not in filial grief were shed those tears for a mother's insanity nor yet because her father was dead for the bowing sir jacob had bowed his head to death with his usual urbanity the waters that down her visage rilled were drops of unrectified spirit distilled from the limbeck of pride and vanity two hundred and ninety seven tears that fell alone and unchecked without relief and without respect like the fabled pearls that the pigs neglect when pigs have that opportunity and of all the griefs that mortals share the one that seems the hardest to bear is the grief without community two hundred and ninety eight how blessed the heart that has a friend a sympathizing ear to lend to troubles too great to smother for as ale and porter when flat are restored till a sparkling bubbling head they afford so sorrow is cheered by being poured from one vessel into another two hundred and ninety nine but a friend or gossip she had not one to hear the vile deeds that the count had done how night after night he rambled and how she had learned by sad degrees that he drank and smoked and worse than these that he swindled intrigued and gambled three hundred how he kissed the maids and sparred with john and came to bed with his garments on with other offences as heinous and brought strange gentlemen home to dine that he said were in the fancy line and they fancied spirits instead of wine and called her lapdog wenus three hundred and one of making a book how he made a stir but never had written a line to her once his idol and cara sposa and how he had stormed and treated her ill because she refused to go down to a mill she didn't know where but remembered still that the miller's name was mendoza three hundred and two how often he waked her up at night and oftener still by the morning light reeling home from his haunts unlawful singing songs that shouldn't be sung except by beggars and thieves unhung or volleying oaths that a foreign tongue made still more horrid and awful three hundred and three how oft instead of otto rose with vulgar smells he offended her nose from gin tobacco and onion and then how wildly he used to stare and shake his fist at nothing and swear and pluck by the handful his shaggy hair till he looked like a study of giant despair for a new edition of bunyan three hundred and four for dice will run the contrary way as well is known to all who play and cards will conspire as in treason and what with keeping a hunting box following fox friends in flocks burgundies hocks from london docks stultz's frocks manton and knox barrels and locks shooting blue rocks trainers and jocks buskins and socks pugilistical knocks and fighting cocks if he found himself short in funds and stocks these rhymes will furnish the reason three hundred and five his friends indeed were falling away friends who insist on play or pay and he feared at no very distant day to be cut by lord and by cadger as one who has gone or is going to smash 
for his checks no longer drew the cash because as his comrades explained in flash he had overdrawn his badger 306 gold gold alas for the gold spent where souls are bought and sold in vices walpurgis revel alas for muffles and bulldogs and guns the leg that walks and the leg that runs all real evils though fancy ones when they lead to debt dishonour and duns nay to death and perchance the devil three hundred and seven alas for the last of a golden race had she cried her wrongs in the market-place she had warrant for all her clamour for the worst of rogues and brutes and rakes was breaking her heart by constant aches with as little remorse as the pauper who breaks a flint with a parish hammer her last will three hundred and eight now the precious leg while cash was flush or the count's acceptance worth a rush had never created dissension but no sooner the stocks began to fall than without any ossification at all the limb became what people call a perfect bone of contention three hundred and nine for altered days brought altered ways and instead of the complimentary phrase so current before her bridal the countess heard in language low that her precious leg was precious slow a good un to look at but bad to go and kept quite a sum lying idle three hundred and ten that instead of playing musical airs like colin's foot in going upstairs as the wife in the scottish ballad declares it made an infernal stumping whereas a member of cork or wood would be lighter and cheaper and quite as good without the unbearable thumping three hundred and eleven perhaps she thought it a decent thing to show her calf to cobbler and king but nothing could be absurder while none but the crazy would advertise their gold before their servants eyes who of course some night would make it a prize by a shocking and barbarous murder three hundred and twelve but in spite of hint and threat and scoff the leg kept its situation for legs are not to be taken off by a verbal amputation and mortals when they take a whim the greater the folly the stiffer the limb that stand upon it or by it so the countess then miss kilmanseg at her marriage refused to stir a peg till the lawyers had fastened on her leg as fast as the law could tie it three hundred and thirteen firmly then and more firmly yet with scorn for scorn and with threat for threat the proud one confronted the cruel and loud and bitter the quarrel arose fierce and merciless one of those with spoken daggers and looks like blows in all but the bloodshed a duel three hundred and fourteen rash and wild and wretched and wrong were the words that came from weak and strong till maddened for desperate matters fierce as tigress escaped from her den she flew to her desk twas opened and then in the time it takes to try a pen or the clerk to utter his slow amen her will was in fifty tatters three hundred and fifteen but the count instead of curses wild only nodded his head and smiled as if at the spleen of an angry child but the calm was deceitful and sinister a lull like the lull of the treacherous sea for hate in that moment had sworn to be the golden leg's sole legatee and that very night to administer her death three hundred and sixteen tis a stern and startling thing to think how often mortality stands on the brink of its grave without any misgiving and yet in this slippery world of strife in the stir of human bustle so rife there are daily sounds to tell us that life is dying and death is living three hundred and seventeen i beauty the girl and love the boy bright as they are with hope and joy how their souls would sadden instant her to remember that one of those wedding bells which ring so merrily through the dells is the same that knells our last farewells only broken into a canter three hundred and eighteen but breath and blood set doom at naught how little the wretched countess thought when at night she unloosed her sandal that the fates had woven her burial cloth and that death in the shape of a death's head moth was fluttering round her candle three hundred and nineteen as she looked at her clock of ormolu for the hour she had gone so wearily through at the end of a day of trial how little she saw in her pride of prime the dart of death in the hand of time that hand which moved on the dial three hundred and twenty
320 as she went with her taper up the stair how little her swollen eye was aware that the shadow which followed was double or when she closed her chamber door it was shutting out and for evermore the world and its worldly trouble 321 little she dreamt as she laid aside her jewels after one glance of pride they were solemn bequests to vanity or when her robes she began to doff that she stood so near to the putting off of the flesh that clothes humanity 322 and when she quenched the taper's light how little she thought as the smoke took flight that her day was done and merged in a night of dreams and duration uncertain or along with her own that a hand of bone was closing mortality's curtain 323 but life is sweet and mortality blind and youth is hopeful and fate is kind in concealing the day of sorrow and enough is the present tense of toil for this world is to all a stiffish soil and the mind flies back with a glad recoil from the debts not due till tomorrow. 324 wherefore else does the spirit fly and bid its daily cares good-bye along with its daily clothing just as the felon condemned to die with a very natural loathing leaving the sheriff to dream of ropes from his gloomy cell in a vision elopes to a caper on sunny gleams and slopes instead of a dance upon nothing 325 thus even thus the countess slept while death still nearer and nearer crept like the thane who smote the sleeping but her mind was busy with early joys her golden treasures and golden toys that flashed a bright and golden light under lids still red with weeping 326 the golden doll that she used to hug her coral of gold and the golden mug her godfather's golden presence the golden service she had at her meals the golden watch and chain and seals her golden scissors and thread and reels and her golden fishes and pheasants 327 the golden guineas in silken purse and the golden legends she heard from her nurse of the mayor in his gilded carriage and london streets that were paved with gold and the golden eggs that were laid of old with each golden thing to the golden ring at her own auriferous marriage 328 and still the golden light of the sun through her golden dream appeared to run though the night that roared without was one to terrify seamen or gypsies while the moon as if in malicious mirth kept peeping down at the ruffled earth as though she enjoyed the tempest's birth in revenge of her old eclipses 329 but vainly vainly the thunder fell for the soul of the sleeper was under a spell that time had lately embittered the count as once at her foot he knelt that foot which now he wanted to melt but hush twas a stir at her pillow she felt and some object before her glittered 330 twas the golden leg she knew its gleam and up she started and tried to scream but even in the moment she started down came the limb with a frightful smash and lost in the universal flash that her eyeballs made at so mortal a crash the spark called vital departed 331 gold still gold hard yellow and cold for gold she had lived and she died for gold by a golden weapon not oaken in the morning they found her all alone stiff and bloody and cold as stone but her leg the golden leg was gone and the golden bowl was broken 332 gold still gold it haunted her yet at the golden lion the inquest met its foreman a carver and gilder and the jury debated from twelve till three what the verdict ought to be and they brought it in as felo de se because her own leg had killed her her moral gold 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 bright and yellow hard and cold molten graven hammered and rolled heavy to get and light to hold hoarded bartered bought and sold stolen borrowed squandered doled spurned by the young but hugged by the old to the very verge of the churchyard mould price of many a crime untold gold 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 good or bad a thousandfold how widely its agencies vary 
to save to ruin to curse to bless as even its minted coins express now stamped with the image of good queen bess and now of a bloody mary end of section seven end of miss kilmanseg and her precious leg a golden legend this recording is in the public domain The Lee Shore by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway Sleet and hail and thunder And ye winds that rave Till the sands thereunder Tinge with sullen wave Winds that like a demon Howl that horrid note Round the toiling seaman In his tossing boat from his humble dwelling on the shingly shore where the billows swelling keep such hollow roar from that weeping woman seeking with her cries succour superhuman from the frowning skies from the urchin pining from his father's knee from the lattice shining drive him out to sea let broad leagues dissever him from yonder foam. O oh God, to think man ever comes too near his home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Sonnet The world is with me and its many cares, its woes, its wants, the anxious hopes and fears that wait on all terrestrial affairs, the shades of former and of future years, foreboding fancies and prophetic tears, quelling a spirit that was once elate. Heavens, what a wilderness this earth appears, where youth and mirth and health are out of date, but no. A laugh of innocence and joy resounds, like music of the fairy race. And gladly turning from the world's annoy, I gaze upon a little radiant face, and bless, internally, the merry boy who makes a sunshine in a shady place. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Elm Tree by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. A Dream in the Woods. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, as you like it. Part One. Twas in a shady avenue where the lofty elms abound, and from a tree there came to me a sad and solemn sound that sometimes murmured overhead, and sometimes underground. Amongst the leaves it seemed to sigh, amid the boughs to moan. It muttered in the stem, and then the roots took up the tone, as if beneath the dewy grass the dead began to grow. No breeze there was to stir the leaves, no bolts that tempest launch to rend the trunk or rugged bark, no gale to bend the branch, no quake of earth to heave the roots that stood so stiff and staunch. No bird was preening up aloft to rustle with its wing. No squirrel in its sport or fear from bough to bough to spring. The solid hole had ne'er a hole to hide a living thing. No scooping hollow cell to lodge a furtive beast or fowl. The marten, bat, or forest cat that nightly loves to prowl. Nor ivy nooks so apt to shroud the moping snoring owl. But still the sound was in my ear. A sad and solemn sound, and sometimes murmured overhead, and sometimes underground. Twas in a shady avenue where lofty elms abound. O oh, hath the dryad still a tongue in this ungenial clime? Have sylvan spirits still a voice as in the classic prime, to make the forest voluble as in the olden time? The olden time is dead and gone, its years have filled their sum. And e'en in Greece, her native Greece, the sylvan nymph is dumb, 
from ash and beech and aged oak no classic whispers come from poplar pine and drooping birch and fragrant linden trees no living sound e'er hovers round unless the vagrant breeze the music of the merry bird or hum of busy bees but busy bees forsake the elm that bears no bloom aloft the finch was in the hawthorn bush the blackbird in the croft and among the firs the brooding dove that else might murmur soft yet still i heard that solemn sound and sad it was to boot from every hanging bough and each minuter shoot from rugged trunk and mossy rind and from the twisted root from these a melancholy moan for those a dreary sigh and if the boughs were wintry bare and wild winds sweeping by whereas the smallest fleecy cloud was steadfast in the sky nor sign or touch of stirring air could either sense observe the zephyr had not breath enough the thistle down to swerve or force the glimmy gossamers to take another curve in still and silent slumber hushed all nature seemed to be from heaven above or earth beneath no whispers came to me except the solemn sound and sad from that mysterious tree a hollow 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 sound as is that dreamy roar when distant billows boil and bound along a shingly shore but the ocean brim was far aloof a hundred miles or more no murmur of the gusty sea no tumult of the beach however they may foam and fret the bounded sense could reach methought the trees in mystic tongue were talking each to each mayhap rehearsing ancient tales of greenwood love or guilt of whispered vows beneath their boughs or blood obscurely spilt or of that near-hand mansion house a royal tudor built perchance a booty won or shared beneath the starry cope or where the suicidal wretch hung up the fatal rope or beauty kept an evil tryst ensnared by love and hope of graves perchance untimely scooped at midnight dark and dank and what is underneath the sod whereon the grass is rank of old intrigues and privy leagues tradition leaves in blank of traitor lips that muttered plots of kin who fought and fell god knows the undiscovered schemes the arts and acts of hell performed long generations since if trees had tongues to tell with wary eyes and ears alert as one who walks afraid i wandered down the dappled path of mingled light and shade how sweetly gleamed the arch of blue beyond the green arcade how cheerily shone the glimpse of heaven beyond the verdant isle all overarched with lofty elms that quench the light the while as dim and chill as serves to fill some old cathedral pile and many a gnarled trunk was there that ages long had stood till time had wrought them into shapes like pan's fantastic brood or still more foul and hideous forms that pagans carve in wood a crouching satyr lurking near and there a goblin grim as staring full a demon life as gothic sculptor's whim a marvel it had scarcely been to hear a voice from him some whisper from that horrid mouth of strange unearthly tone or wild infernal laugh to chill one's marrow to the bone but no it grins like rigid death and silent as a stone as silent as its fellows be for all is mute with them the branch that climbs the leafy roof the rough and mossy stem the crooked root the tender shoot where hangs the dewy gem one mystic tree alone there is of sad and solemn sound that sometimes murmurs overhead and sometimes underground in all that shady avenue where lofty elms abound part two the scene is changed no green arcade no trees all ranged a row but scattered like a beaten host dispersing to and fro with here and there a sylvan course that fell before the foe the foe that down in yonder dell pursues his daily toil as witness many a prostrate trunk bereft of leafy spoil hard by its wooden stump whereon the adder loves to coil alone he works his ringing blows have banished bird and beast the hind and fawn have cantered off a hundred yards at least and on the maple's lofty top the linnet's song has ceased no eye his labor overlooks or when he takes his rest 
except the timid thrush that peeps above her secret nest forbid by love to leave the young beneath her speckled breast the woodman's heart is in his work his axe is sharp and good with sturdy arm and steady aim he smites the gaping wood from distant rocks his lusty knocks re-echo many a rood his axe is keen his arm is strong his muscles serve him well his years have reached an extra span the number can tell but still his lifelong task has been the timber tree to fell through summer's parching sultriness and winter's freezing cold from sapling youth to virile growth the age's rigid mould his energetic axe hath rung within the forest old aloft upon his poising still the vivid sunbeams glance about his head and round his feet the forest shadows dance and bounding from his russet coat the acorn drops askance his face is like a druid's face with wrinkles furrowed deep and tanned by scorching suns as brown as corn that's ripe to reap but the hair on brow and cheek and chin is white as wool of sheep his frame is like a giant's frame his legs are long and stark his arms like limbs of not a new his hands like rugged bark so he felleth still with right good will as if to build an ark oh well within his fatal path the fearful tree might quake through every fibre twig and lift with aspen trimmer shake through trunk and root and branch and shoot a low complaining make oh well to him the tree might breathe a sad and solemn sound a sigh that murmured overhead and groans from underground as in that shady avenue where lofty elms abound but calm and mute the maple stands the plain the ash the fir the elm the beech the drooping birch without the least demur and e'en the aspen's hoary leaf makes no unusual stir the pines those old gigantic pines that writhe recalling soon the famous human group that rise with snakes in wild festoon in ramus wrestlings interlaced a forest lacoon like titans of primeval girth by tortures overcome their brown enormous limbs they twine bedewed with tears of gum fierce agonies that ought to yell but like the marble dumb nay yonder blasted elm stands so like a man of sin who frantic flings his arms abroad to feel the worm within for all that gesture so intense it makes no sort of din an universal silence reigns and rugged bark or peel except that very trunk which rings beneath the biting steel meanwhile the woodman plies his axe with unrelenting zeal no rustic song is on his tongue no whistle on his lips but with a quiet thoughtfulness his trusty tool he grips and stroke on stroke keeps hacking out the bright and flying chips stroke after stroke with frequent dent he spreads the fatal gash till lo the remnant fibres rend with harsh and sudden crash and on the dull resounding turf the jarring branches lash oh now the forest trees may sigh the ash the poplar tall the elm the beech the drooping birch the aspens one and all with solemn groan and hollow moan lament a comrade's fall a goodly elm of noble girth that thrice the human span while on their variegated course the constant seasons ran through gale and hail and fiery bolt had stood erect as man but now like mortal man himself struck down by the hand of god or heathen idol tumbled prone beneath the eternal's nod in all its giant bulk and strength it lies in the sod ay now the forest trees may grieve and make a common moan around that patriarchal trunk so newly overthrown and with a murmur recognize a doom to be their own the echo sleeps the idle axe a disregarded tool lies crushing with its passive weight the toad's reputed stool the woodman wipes his dewy brow within the shadows cool no zephyr stirs the ear may catch the smallest insect hum but on the disappointed sense no mystic whispers come no tone of sylvan sympathy the forest trees are dumb 
no leafy noise nor inward voice no sad and solemn sound that sometimes murmurs overhead and sometimes underground as in that shady avenue where lofty elms abound part three the deed is done the tree is low that stood so long and firm the woodman and his axe are gone his toil has found its term and where he wrought the speckled thrush securely hunts the worm the coney from the sandy bank has run a rapid race through thistle bent and tangled fern to seek the open space and on its haunches sits erect to clean its furry face a dappled fawn is close at hand the hind is browsing near and on the larch's lowest bough the ousel whistles clear but checks the note within its throat as choked with sudden fear with sudden fear her worm request the thrush abruptly quits through thistle bent the tangled fern the startled coney flits and on the larch's lowest bough no more the ousel sits with sudden fear the dappled deer effect a swift escape but well might bolder creatures start and fly or stand agape with rising hair and curdled blood to see so grim a shape the very sky turns pale above the earth grows dark beneath the human terror thrills with cold and draws a shorter breath and universal panic owns the dread approach of death with silent pace as shadows come and dark as shadows be the grisly phantom takes his stand beside the fallen tree and scans it with his gloomy eyes and laughs with horrid glee a dreary laugh and desolate where mirth is void and null as hollow as it echo sounds within the hollow skull whoever laid this tree along his hatchet was not dull the human arm and human tool have done their duty well but after sound of ringing axe must sound the ringing knell when elm or oak have felt the stroke my turn is to fell no passive unregarded tree a senseless thing of wood wherein the sluggish sap ascends to swell the vernal bud but conscious moving breathing trunks that throb with living blood no forest monarch yearly clad in mantle green or brown that unrecorded lives and falls by hand of rustic clown but kings who don the purple robe and wear the jewelled crown ah little wrecks the royal mind within his banquet hall while tapers shine and music breathes and beauty leads the ball he little wrecks the oaken plank shall be his palace wall ah little dreams that haughty peer the while his falcon flies for on the blood bedabbled turf the antlered quarry dies that in his own ancestral park the narrow dwelling lies but haughty peer and mighty king one doom shall overwhelm the oaken cell shall lodge him well whose sceptre ruled a realm while he who never knew a home shall find it in the elm the tattered lean dejected wretch who begs from door to door and dies within the cressy ditch or on the barren moor the friendly elm shall lodge and clothe the houseless man and poor yea this recumbent rugged trunk that lies so long and prone with many a fallen acorn cup and mast and furry cone this rugged trunk shall hold its share of mortal flesh and bone a miser hoarding heaps of gold but pale with ague fears a wife lamenting love's decay with secret cruel tears distilling bitter bitter drops from sweets of former years a man within whose gloomy mind offence has deeply sunk who out of fierce revenge's cup hath madly darkly drunk grief avarice and hate shall sleep within this very trunk this massy trunk that lies along and many more must fall for the very knave who digs the grave the man who spreads the pall and he who tolls the funeral bell the elm shall have them all the tall abounding elm that grows in hedgerows up and down in field and forest copse and park and in the peopled town with colonies of noisy rooks that nestle on its crown and well the bounding elm may grow in field and hedge so rife in forest copse and wooded park and mid the city strife for every hour that passes by shall end a human life the phantom ends the shade is gone the sky is clear and bright of turf and moss and fallen tree 
there glows a ruddy light and bounding through the golden fern the rabbit comes to bite the thrush's mate beside her sits and pipes a merry lay the dove is in the evergreen and on the largest spray the flybird flutters up and down to catch its tiny prey the gentle hind and dappled fawn are coming up the glade each harmless furred and feathered thing is glad and not afraid but on my saddened spirit still the shadow leaves a shade a secret vague prophetic gloom as though by certain mark i knew the fore appointed tree within whose rugged bark this warm and living frame shall find its narrow house and dark that mystic tree which breathed to me a sad and solemn sound that sometimes murmured overhead and sometimes underground within that shady avenue where lofty elms abound end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lear by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. A poor old king with sorrow for my crown, throned upon straw, and mantled with the wind. For pity my own tears have made me blind, that I might never see my children's frown. And may be madness, like a friend, has thrown a folded fillet over my dark mind so that unkindly speech may sound for kind albeit i know not i am childish grown and have not gold to purchase wit withal i that have once maintained most royal state a very bankrupt now that may not call my child my child all beggared save in tears wherewith i daily weep an old man's fate foolish and blind and overcome with years. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Panama. Sonnet My heart is sick with longing, though I feed on hope. Time goes with such a heavy pace that neither brings nor takes from thy embrace, as if he slept, forgetting his old speed. For, as in sunshine only we can read the march of minutes on the dial's face, so in the shadows of this lonely place there is no love, and time is dead indeed. But when, dear lady, I am near thy heart, thy smile is time, and then so swift it flies, it seems we only meet to tear apart with aching hands and lingering of eyes alas alas that we must learn hours flight by the same light of love that makes them bright end of poem this recording is in the public domain the song of the shirt by thomas hood Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. With fingers weary and worn, with eyelids heavy and red, a woman sat in unwomanly rags, plying her needle and thread. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger, and dirt, and still with a voice of dolorous pitch, she sang the song of the shirt work 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 while the cock is crowing aloof and work 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 till the stars shine through the roof it's oh to be a slave along with the barbarous turk where woman has never a soul to save if this is christian work 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 till the brain begins to swim work 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 till the eyes are heavy and dim seam and gusset and band band and gusset and seam till over the buttons i fall asleep and sew them on in a dream o oh, men with sisters dear o oh, men with mothers and wives it is not 
linen you're wearing out, but human creatures' lives. Stitch, stitch, stitch in poverty, hunger, and dirt, sewing at once with a double thread, a shroud as well as a shirt. But why do I talk of death, that phantom of grisly bone? I hardly fear his terrible shape, it seems so like my own. It seems so like my own because of the fasts I keep. O oh God, that bread should be so dear, and flesh and blood so cheap. Work, 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 my labor never flags. And what are its wages? A bed of straw, a crust of bread, and rags. That shattered roof and this naked floor, a table, a broken chair, and a wall so blank, my shadow I thank for sometimes falling there. Work, work, work from weary chime to chime work 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 as prisoners work for crime band and gusset and seam seam and gusset and band till the heart is sick and the brain be numbed as well as the weary hand work 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 in the dull december light and work 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 while the weather is warm and bright while underneath the eaves the brooding swallows cling as if to show me their sunny backs and twit me with the spring oh but to breathe the breath of the cowslip and primrose sweet with the sky above my head and the grass beneath my feet for only one short hour to feel as i used to feel before i knew the woes of want and the walk that costs a meal oh but for one short hour a respite however brief no blessed leisure for love or hope but only time for grief a little weeping would ease my heart but in their briny bed my tears must stop for every drop hinders needle and thread with fingers weary and worn with eyelids heavy and red a woman sat in unwomanly rags plying her needle and thread stitch 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 in poverty hunger and dirt and still with a voice of dolorous pitch would that its tone could reach the rich she sang this song of the shirt. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pauper's Christmas Carol by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Nemo. The Pauper's Christmas Carol. Full of drink and full of meat on our Saviour's natal day charity's perennial treat thus i heard a pauper say ought not i to dance and sing thus supplied with famous cheer hi o oh, i hardly know christmas comes but once a year after labor's long turmoil sorry fare and frequent fast two and fifty weeks of toil pudding time is come at last but our raisins higher low flour and suet cheaper dear hi -o, i hardly know christmas comes but once a year fed upon the coarsest fare three hundred days and sixty-four but for one on viands rare just as if i wasn't poor ought not i to bless my stars warden clerk and overseer hi -o, i hardly know christmas comes but once a year treated like a welcome guest one of nature's social chain seated tended on and pressed but when shall i be pressed again twice to pudding thrice to beef a dozen times to ale and beer hi -o, i hardly know 
Christmas comes but once a year. Come tomorrow how it will, diet scant and usage rough, hunger once has had its fill, thirst for once has had enough. But shall I ever dine again, or see another feast appear? hi -o, I only know, Christmas comes but once a year. Frozen cares begin to melt, hopes revive and spirits flow, feeling as I have not felt since a dozen months ago. Glad enough to sing a song, tomorrow shall I volunteer? hi -o, I hardly know, Christmas comes but once a year. Bright and blessed is the time, sorrow's end and joys begin while the bells with merry chime ring the day of plenty in but the happy tide to hail with a sigh or with a tear hi oh i hardly know christmas comes but once a year end a poem this recording is in the public domain the haunted house by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by nemo the Haunted House, A Romance A jolly place, said he, in days of old, but something ails it now. The spot is cursed. Wordsworth Part One Some dreams we have are nothing else but dreams, unnatural and full of contradictions. Yet others of our most romantic schemes are something more than fictions. It might be only on enchanted ground. It might be merely by a thought's expansion. But, in the spirit or the flesh, I found an old deserted mansion. A residence for woman, child, and man. A dwelling place, and yet no habitation. A house, but under some prodigious ban of excommunication. Unhinged, the iron gates half-open hung jarred by the gusty gales of many winters, that from its crumbled pedestal had flung one marble globe in splinters. No dog was at the threshold, great or small, no pigeon on the roof, no household creature, no cat demurely dozing on the wall, not one domestic feature. No human figure stirred to go or come, no face looked forth from shut or open casement, no chimney smoked, there was no sign of home, from parapet to basement. With shattered panes the grassy court was starred, the time-worn coping-stone had tumbled after, when through the ragged roof the sky shone barred with naked beam and rafter. O'er all there hung a shadow and a fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, The place is haunted. The flower grew wild and rankly as the weed, Roses with thistles struggled for a smile, and vagrant plants of parasitic breed had overgrown the dial. But gay or gloomy, steadfast or infirm, no heart was there to heed the hour's duration. All times and tides were lost in one long term of stagnant desolation. The wren had built within the porch. She found its quiet loneliness so sure and thorough. And on the lawn, Within its turfy mound, the rabbit made his burrow. The rabbit wild and gray that flitted through the shrubby clumps and frisked and sat and vanished, but leisurely and bold as if he knew his enemy was banished. The wary crow, the pheasant from the woods, lulled by the still and everlasting sameness, close to the mansion like domestic broods, fed with a shocking tameness. The coot was swimming in the reedy pond, beside the water hen so soon affrighted, and in the weedy moat the heron, fond of solitude, alighted. The moping heron, motionless and stiff, that on a stone, as silently and stilly, stood, an apparent sentinel, as if, to guard the water lily. No sound was heard except, from far away, the ringing of the whitwall's shrilly laughter or now and then the chatter of the jay that echo murmured after but echo never mocked the human tongue some weighty crime that heaven could not pardon a secret curse on that old building hung 
and its deserted garden. The beds were all untouched by hand or tool. No footstep marked the damp and mossy gravel. Each walk is green as is the mantled pool, for want of human travel. The vine unpruned and the neglected peach drooped from the wall with which they used to grapple. And on the cankered tree, in easy reach, rotted the golden apple. But awfully the truant shunned the ground. The vagrant kept aloof and daring poacher, in spite of gaps that through the fences round, invited the encroacher. For over all there hung a cloud of fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said, as plain as whisper in the ear, The place is haunted. The pier and quince lay squandered on the grass. The mould was purple with unheeded showers. Of bloomy plums, a wilderness it was, of fruits and weeds and flowers. The mirror gold amidst the nettles blue, the gourd embraced the rosebush in its ramble, the thistle and the stock together grew, the hollyhock and bramble. The beer bine with the lilac interlaced, the sturdy burdock choked its slender neighbor, the spicy pink all tokens were effaced of human care and labor. The very you formality had trained to such a rigid pyramidal stature, for want of trimming had almost regained the raggedness of nature. The fountain was a dry, neglect in time had marred the work of artisan and mason, and F's and croaking frogs, god of slime, sprawled in the ruined basin. The statue, fallen from its marble base, amidst the refuse leaves and herbage rotten, lay like the idol of some bygone race, its name and rights forgotten. On every side the aspect was the same, all ruined, desolate, forlorn, and savage. No hand or foot within the precinct came to rectify or ravage. For over all there hung a cloud of fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, the place is haunted. Part Two Oh, very gloomy is the house of woe, where tears are falling while the bell is knelling, with all the dark solemnities which show that death is in the dwelling. Oh, very, very dreary is the room where love, domestic love, no longer nestles, but, smitten by the common stroke of doom, the corpse lies on the trestles. But house of woe and hearse and sable pall, the nearer home of the departed mortal, nearer looks so gloomy as the ghostly hall, with its deserted portal. The centipede along the threshold crept, the cobweb hung across in mazy tangle, and in its winding sheet the maggot slept at every nook and angle. The keyhole lodged the earwig and her brood, the emmets of the steps had old possession, and marched in search of their diurnal food in undisturbed procession. As undisturbed as the prehensile cell, of moth or maggot or the spider's tissue, for never foot upon the threshold fell to enter or to issue. O'er all there hung the shadow of a fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, the place is haunted. How bite the door I pushed, or so I dreamed, which slowly, slowly gaped the hinges creaking, with such a rusty eloquence it seemed, the time himself was speaking. But time was dumb within that mansion old, or left his tale to the heraldic banners that hung from the corroded walls and told of former men and manners. Those tattered flags that with the open door seemed the old wave of battle to remember, while fallen fragments danced upon the floor like dead leaves in December. The startled bats flew out, bird after bird, the screech owl overhead began to flutter, and seemed to mock the cry that she had heard, some dying victim utter. A shriek that echoed from the joisted roof, and up the stair, and further still and further, till in some ringing chamber far aloof, it ceased its tale of murder. Meanwhile the rusty armor rattled round, the banner shuddered, and the ragged streamer, all things the horrid tenor of the sound, acknowledged with a dreamer. The antlers where the helmet hung and belt 
stirred as the tempest stirs the forest branches, or as the stag had trembled when he felt the bloodhound at his haunches. The window jingled in its crumbled frame, and through its many gaps of destitution, dolorous moans and hollow sighings came, like those of dissolution. The woodlouse dropped and rolled into a ball, touched by some impulse, occult or mechanic, and nameless beetles ran along the wall in universal panic. The subtle spider that from overhead hung like a spy on human guilt and error, suddenly turned and up its slender thread ran with a nimble terror. The very stains and fractures on the wall, assuming features solemn and terrific, hinted some tragedy of that old hall, locked up in hieroglyphic. Some tale that might, perchance, have solved the doubt, wherefore amongst those flags so dull and livid, the banner of the bloody hand shone out, so ominously vivid. Some key to that inscrutable appeal, which made the very frame of nature quiver, in every thrilling nerve and fibre feel, so ague like a shiver. For over all there hung a cloud of fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, The place is haunted. If but a rat had lingered in the house, to lure the thought into a social channel, but not a rat remained or tiny mouse to squeak behind the panel. Huge drops rolled down the walls as if they wept, and where the cricket used to chirp so shrilly, the toad was squatting and the lizard crept on that damp hearth and chilly. For years no cheerful blaze had sparkled there, or glanced on coat of buff or knightly metal. The slug was crawling on the vacant chair, the snail upon the settle. The floor was redolent of mold and must, the fungus and the rotten seams had quickened, while on the oaken table coats of dust perennially had thickened. No mark of leathern jack or metal can, no cup, no horn, no hospitable token, all social ties between that board and man had long ago been broken. There was so foul a rumor in the air, the shadow of a presence so atrocious, no human creature could have feasted there, even the most ferocious. For over all there hung a cloud of fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, The place is haunted. Part 3 Tis hard for human actions to account, whether from reason or from impulse only, but some internal prompting bade me mount, the gloomy stairs and lonely. Those gloomy stairs so dark and damp and cold, with the odors as from bones and relics carnal, deprived of rite and consecrated mold, the chapel vault or charnel. Those dreary stairs were with a sounding stress of every step so many echoes blended, the mind with dark misgivings feared to guess how many feet ascended. The tempest with its spoils had drifted in, till each unwholesome stone was darkly spotted, as thickly as the leopard's dappled skin, with leaves that rankly rotted. The air was thick, and in the upper gloom the bat, or something in its shape, was winging, and on the wall, as chilly as a tomb, the death-head's moth was clinging. That mystic moth, which, with a sense profound, of all unholy presence augurs truly, and with a grim significance flits around, the taper burning bluely. Such omens in the place there seemed to be, at every crooked turn or on the landing, the straining eyeball was prepared to see some apparition standing. For over all there hung a cloud of fear, a sense of mystery the spirit daunted, and said as plain as whisper in the ear, The place is haunted. Yet no portentous shape the sight amazed, each object plain and tangible and valid. But from their tarnished frames dark figures gazed, and faces spectre pallid. Not merely with a mimic life that lies within the compass of art's simulation, their souls were looking through their painted eyes with awful speculation. 
on every lip a speechless horror dwelt on every brow the burden of affliction the old ancestral spirits knew and felt the house's malediction such earnest woe their features overcast they might have stirred or sighed or wept or spoken but save the hollow moaning of the blast the stillness was unbroken no other sound or stir of life was there except my steps in solitary clamber from flight to flight from humid stair to stair from chamber into chamber deserted rooms of luxury and state that old magnificence had richly furnished with pictures cabinets of ancient date in carvings gilt and burnished rich hangings storied by the needle's art with scripture history or classic fable but all had faded save one ragged part where cain was slaying abel the silent waste of mildew and the moth had marred the tissue with a partial ravage but undecaying frowned upon the cloth each feature stern and savage the sky was pale the cloud a thing of doubt some hues were fresh and some decayed and duller but still the bloody hand shone strangely out with vehemence of colour the bloody hand that with a lurid stain shone on the dusty floor a dismal token projected from the casement's painted pane where all beside was broken the bloody hand significant of crime that glaring on the old heraldic banner had kept its crimson unimpaired by time in such a wondrous manner o'er all there hung the shadow of a fear a sense of mystery the spirit daunted and said as plain as whisper in the air the place is haunted the death watch ticked behind the panelled oak inexplicable tremors shook the heiress an echo strange and mystical awoke the fancy to embarrass prophetic hints that filled the soul of dread but through one gloomy entrance pointing mostly the while some secret inspiration said that chamber is the ghostly across the door no gossamer festoon swung pendulous no web no dusty fringes no silky chrysalis or white cocoon about its nooks and hinges the spider shunned the interdicted room the moth the beetle and the fly were banished and where the sunbeam felt athwart the gloom the very midge had vanished one lonely ray that glanced upon a bed as if with awful aim direct and certain to show the bloody hand in burning red embroidered on the curtain and yet no gory stain was on the quilt the pillow in its place had slowly rotted the floor alone retained the trace of guilt those boards obscurely spotted obscurely spotted to the door and thence with mazy doubles to the grated casement oh what a tale they told of fear intense of horror and amazement what human creature in the dead of night had coursed like a hunted hare that cruel distance had sought the door the window in his flight striving for dear existence what shrieking spirit in that bloody room its mortal frame had violently quitted across the sunbeam with a sudden gloom a ghostly shadow flitted across the sunbeam and along the wall but painted on the air so very dimly it hardly veiled the tapestry at all or portrait frowning grimly or all there hung the shadow of a fear a sense of mystery the spirit daunted and said as plain as whisper in the ear the place is haunted end of poem this recording is in the public domain the mary a seaside sketch by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by larry wilson Blowest thou not, Alice, with the early tide to see the hardy fisher hoist his mast and stretch his sail towards the ocean wide, like God's own beadsman going forth to cast his net into the deep, which doth provide enormous bounties hidden in its vast bosom like charities for all who seek and take its gracious boon, thankful and meek? The sea is bright with morning the dark seems still to linger on his broad black sail 
for it is early hoisted like a mark for the low sun to shoot at with his pale and level beams all round the shadowy bark the green wave glimmers and the gentle gale swells in her canvas till the waters show the keel's new speed and whiten at the bow then look abaft for thou canst understand that phrase and there he sitteth at the stern grasping the tiller in his broad brown hand the hardy fisherman thou mayest discern ten fathoms off the wrinkles in the tanned an honest countenance that he will turn to look upon us with a quiet gaze as we are passing on our several ways so some ten days ago on such a morn the mary like a sea mew sought her spoil amongst the thinny race twas when the corn wooed the sharp sickle and the golden toil summoned all rustic hands to fill the horn of ceres to the brim that brave turmoil was at the prime and woodgate went to reap his harvest too upon the broad blue deep his mast was up his anchor heaved aboard his mainsail stretching in the first gray gleams of morning for the wind ben's eye was stored with fishes fishes swam in all his dreams and all the goodly east seemed but a hoard of silvery fishes that in shoals and streams groped into the deep dust that filled the sky for him to catch in meshes of his eye for ben had the true sailor's sanguine heart and saw the future with a boy's brave thought no doubts nor faint misgivings had a part in his bright vision say before he caught his fish he sold them in the scaly mart and summed the net proceeds this should have brought despair upon him when his hopes were foiled but though one crop was marred again he toiled and sowed his seed afresh many foul blights perished his hard-won gains yet he had planned no schemes of too extravagant delights no goodly houses on the goodwin sand but a small humble home and loving nights such as his honest heart and earnest hand might fairly purchase were these hopes too airy such as they were they rested on thee mary she was the prize of many toilsome year and hard-won wages on the perilous sea of savings ever since the ship-boy's tear was shed for home and lay beyond the lee she was purveyor of his other dear mary and for the infant yet to be fruit of their married loves these made him dote upon the homely beauties of his boat whose pitch-black hull rolled darkly on the wave no gayer than one single stripe of blue could make her swarthy sides she seemed a slave a negro among boats that only knew hardship and rugged toil no pennons brave flaunted upon the mast but oft a few dark dripping jackets fluttered to the air ensigns of hardihood and toilsome care and when she ventured for the deep she spread a tawny sail against the sun-bright sky dark as a cloud that journeys overhead but then those tawny wings were stretched to fly across the wide sea desert for the bread of babes and mothers many an anxious eye dwelt on her course and many a fervent prayer invoked the heavens to protect and spare where is she now the secrets of the deep are dark and hidden from the human ken only the sea-bird saw the surges sweep over the dark and devoted ben meanwhile a widow sobs and orphans weep and sighs are heard from weather-beaten men dark sunburnt men uncouth and rude and hairy while loungers idly ask where is the mary End of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Lady's Dream by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org By David McClintock The Lady's Dream by Thomas Hood The lady lay in her bed, her couch so warm and soft, but her sleep was restless and broken still, for turning often and oft from side to side she muttered and moaned and tossed her arms aloft. At last she startled up and gazed on the vacant air 
with a look of awe as if she saw some dreadful phantom there. And then in the pillow she buried her face from visions ill to bear. The very curtain shook, her terror was so extreme, and the light that fell on the broidered quilt kept a tremulous gleam, and her voice was hollow and shook as she cried, O oh me, that awful dream, that weary, weary walk in the churchyard's dismal ground, and those horrible things with shady wings that came and flitted round. Death, death, and nothing but death in every sight and sound. And oh, those maidens young who wrought in that dreary room with figures drooping and spectres thin and cheeks without a bloom. And the voice that cried for the pomp of pride we haste to an early tomb. For the pomp and pleasure of pride we toil like Afric slaves and only to earn a home at last where yonder cypress waves. And then they pointed, I never saw a ground so full of graves. And still the coffins came, with their sorrowful trains and slow, coffin after coffin still, a sad and sickening show. From grief exempt, I never had dreamt of such a world of woe, of the hearts that daily break, of the tears that hourly fall, of the many, many troubles of life that grieve this earthly ball, disease and hunger and pain and want, but now I dreamt of them all, for the blind and the cripple were there, and the babe that pined for bread, and the houseless man and the widow poor who begged to bury the dead, the naked, alas, that I might have clad, the famished I might have fed, the sorrow I might have soothed, and the unregarded tears, for many a thronging shape was there from long-forgotten years. I, even the poor rejected moor, who raised my childish fears. Each pleading look that long ago I scanned with a heedless eye, each face was gazing as plainly there as when I passed it by. Woe, woe for me, if the past should be thus present when I die. No need of sulphurous lake, no need of fiery coal, but only that crowd of humankind who wanted pity and dole. In everlasting retrospect will ring my sinful soul. Alas, I have walked through life, too heedless where I trod, nay, helping to trample my fellow worm and fill the burial sod forgetting that even the sparrow falls not unmarked of God. I drank the richest draughts, and ate whatever is good, fish and flesh and fowl and fruit supplied my hungry mood. But I never remembered the wretched ones that starved for want of food. I dressed as the noble dress, in cloth of silver and gold, with silk and satin and costly furs in many an ample fold. But I never remembered the naked limbs that froze with winter's cold, the wounds I might have healed, the human sorrow and smart, and yet it never was in my soul to play so ill a part. But evil is wrought by want of thought as well as want of heart. She clasped her fervent hands, and the tears began to stream. Large and bitter and fast they fell, remorse was so extreme. And yet, oh yet, that many a dame would dream the lady's dream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Key by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson A Moorish Romance On the east coast, towards Tunis, the Moors still preserve the key of their ancestor's house in Spain, to which country they still express the hopes of one day returning and again planting the crescent on the ancient walls of the Alhambra. Scots Travels in Morocco and Algiers Is Spain cloven in such a manner as to want closing? 
Sancho Panza. The Moor leans on his cushion with the pipe between his lips, and still at frequent intervals the sweet sherbet he sips. But spite of lulling vapor and the sober cooling cup, the spirit of the swarthy Moor is fiercely kindling up. One hand is on his pistol, on its ornamented stock, while his finger feels the trigger and is busy with the lock. The other seeks his autogon and clasps its jeweled hilt. Oh, much of gore in days of yore that crooked blade has spilt. His brows are knit, his eyes of jet in vivid blackness roll, and gleam with fatal flashes like the fire damp of the coal. His jaws are set, and through his teeth he draws a savage breath, as if about to raise the shout of victory or death. For why? The last Zebek that came and moored within the mole, such tidings unto Tunis brought as stir his very soul. The cruel jar of civil war, the sad and stormy rain that blackens like a thundercloud the sunny land of Spain. No strife of glorious chivalry, for honor, gain, or loss, nor yet that ancient rivalry, the crescent with the cross. No charge of gallant paladins on Boslem, stern and stanch, but Christian shedding Christian blood beneath the olive's branch. The war of horde parricide, and brother killing brother, yea, like to dogs and sons of dogs, that worry one another, but let them bite and tear and fight, the more the Kaffirs slay. The sooner Hagar's swarming sons shall make the land a prey. The sooner shall the moor behold the Alhambra's pile again, and those who pined in Barbary shall shout for joy in Spain. The sooner shall the crescent wave on dear Granada's walls, and proud Muhammad Ali sit within his father's halls. Allah i Allah, tiger-like, up springs the swarthy moor, and with a wide and hasty stride steps o'er the marble floor, across the hall till from the wall, where such quaint patterns be, with eager hand he snatches down an old and massive key. A massive key of curious shape, and dark with dirt and rust, and well three weary centuries the metal might encrust. For since the king Boabdil fell before the native stock, the ancient key, so quaint to see, hath never been in lock. Brought over by the Saracens, who fled across the main, a token of the secret hope of going back again. From race to race, from hand to hand, from house to house it passed. Oh, will it ever, ever ope the palace gate at last? Three hundred years and fifty-two, on post and wall at hung. Three hundred years and fifty-two, a dream to old and young. But now a brighter destiny the prophet's will accords. The time has come to scour the rust and lubricate the wards. For should the moor with sword and lance at Al Jazeera's land, where is the old Bernardo now, their progress to withstand? To Burgos should the Moslem come, where is the noble Cid? Five royal crowns to topple down, as gallant Diaz did. Hath Xerxes any pounder now, when other weapons fail, with club to thrash invaders rash like barley with a flail? Hath Seville any Perez still to lay his clusters low, and ride with seven turbans green around his saddle-bow? No, never more shall Europe see such heroes brave and bold, such valor, faith, and loyalty, as used to shine of old. No longer to one battle cry united Spaniards run, and with their thronging spears uphold the Virgin and her son, whom Cadiz Bay through Biscay internal discord dwells, and Barcelona bears the scars of Spanish shot and shells. The fleets decline, the merchants pine for want of foreign trade, and gold is scant, and Alicante is sealed by strict blockade. The loyal fly, the valor falls, opposed by court intrigue. But treachery and traitors thrive, upheld by foreign league, while factions seeking private ends by turns usurping reign. Well may the dreaming, scheming moor, exulting, point to Spain. Well may he cleanse the rusty key with Afric, sand, and oil, and hope an Andalusian home shall recompense the toil. Well may he swear the Moorish spear through wild Castile shall sweep, and where the Catalonians sowed, the Saracen shall reap. Well may he vow to spurn the cross beneath the Arab hoof, and plant the crescent yet again above the Alhambra's roof. 
then those from whom Sehago's name in chorus once arose are shouting faction's battle cries and spain forgets to close well may he swear his atagan shall rout the traitor swarm and carve them into arabesques that show no human form the blame be theirs whose bloody feuds invite the savage moor and tempt him with the ancient key to seek the ancient door in the poem this recording is in the public domain the workhouse clock by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin the workhouse clock an allegory there is a murmur in the air a noise in every street the murmur of many tongues the noise of numerous feet while round the workhouse door the labouring classes flock for why the overseer of the poor is setting the workhouse clock who does not hear the tramp of thousands speeding along of either sex and various stamp sickly cripple or strong walking limping creeping from court and alley and lane but all in one direction sweeping like rivers that seek the main who does not see them sally from mill and garret and room in lane and court and alley from homes in poverty's lowest valley furnished with shuttle and loom poor slaves of civilization's galley and in the road and footways rally as if for day of doom some of hardly human form stunted crooked and crippled by toil dingy with smoke and dust and oil and smirched besides with vicious soil clustering mustering all in a swarm father mother and careful child looking as if it had never smiled the sempstress lean and weary and wan with only the ghosts of garments on the weaver her sallow neighbour the grim and sooty artisan every soul child woman or man who lives or dies by labour stirred by an overwhelming zeal and social impulse a terrible throng leaves shuttle and needle and wheel furnace and grindstone spindle and reel thread and yarn and iron and steel yea rest and the yet untasted meal gushing rushing crushing along a very torrent of man urged by the sighs of sorrows and wrong grown at last to a hurricane strong stop its course who can stop who can its onward course an irresistible moral force o vain and idle dream for surely as men are all akin whether of fair or sable skin according to nature's scheme that human's movement contains within a blood power stronger than steam onward onward with hasty feet they swarm and westward still masses born to drink and eat but starving amidst white chapels meet and famishing down corn hill through the poultry but still unfed christian charity hang your head hungry passing the street of bread thirsty the street of milk ragged beside the ludgate mart so gorgeous through mechanic art with cotton and wool and silk at last before that door that bears so many a knock ere ever it opens to sick or poor like sheep they huddle and flock and would that all the good and wise could see the millions of hollow eyes with a gleam derived from hope and the skies upturned to the workhouse clock oh that the parish powers who regulate labour's hours the daily amount of human trial weariness pain and self-denial would turn from the artificial dial that striketh ten or eleven and go for once by that older one that stands in the light of nature's sun and takes its time from heaven end of poem this recording is in the public domain the bridge of sighs by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by leonard wilson of springfield ohio one more unfortunate weary of breath rashly importunate gone to her death take her up tenderly lift her with care fashioned so slenderly young 
and so fair look at her garments clinging like cerements whilst the wave constantly drips from her clothing take her up instantly loving not loathing touch her not scornfully think of her mournfully gently and humanly not of the stains of her all that remains of her now is pure womanly make no deep scrutiny into her mutiny rash and undutiful past all dishonour death has left on her only the beautiful still for all slips of hers one of eve's family wipe those poor lips of hers oozing so clamily loop up her tresses escaped from the comb her fair auburn tresses whilst wonderment guesses where was her home who was her father who was her mother had she a sister had she a brother or was there a dearer one still and a nearer one yet than all other alas for the rarity of christian charity under the sun oh it was pitiful near a whole city full home she had none sisterly brotherly and fatherly motherly feelings had changed love by harsh evidence thrown from its eminence even god's providence seeming estranged where the lamps quiver so far in the river with many a light from window and casement from garret to basement she stood with amazement houseless by night the bleak wind of march made her tremble and shiver but not the dark arch or the black flowing river mad from life's history glad to death's mystery swift to be hurled anywhere anywhere out of the world in she plunged boldly no matter how coldly the rough river ran over the brink of it picture it think of it dissolute man lave in it drink of it then if you can take her up tenderly lift her with care fashioned so slenderly young and so fair ere her limbs frigidly stiffened too rigidly decently kindly smooth and compose them and her eyes close them staring so blindly dreadfully staring through muddy impurity as when with a daring last look of despairing fixed on futurity perishing gloomily spurred by contumely cold inhumanity burning insanity into her rest cross her hands humbly as if praying dumbly over her breast owning her weakness her evil behaviour and leaving with meekness her sins to her saviour End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lay of the Laborer by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Gachuk. A spade, a rake, a hoe, a pickaxe, or a bill, a hook to reap, or a scythe to mow a flail or what ye will and here's a ready hand to ply the needful tool and skilled enough by lessons rough in labor's rugged school to hedge or dig the ditch to lop or fell the tree to lay the swarth on the sultry field or plow the stubborn lee the harvest stack to bind the wheaten rick to thatch and never fear in my pouch to find the tinder or the match to a flaming barn or farm my fancies never roam the fire i yearn to kindle and burn 
is on the hearth of home where children huddle and crouch through long dark winter days where starving children huddle and crouch to see the cheerful rays a-glowing on the haggard cheek and not in the haggard's blaze to him who sends a drought to parch the fields forlorn the rain to flood the meadows with mud the blight to blast the corn to him i leave to guide the bolt in its crooked path to strike the miser's rick and show the skies blood-red with wrath a spade a rake a hoe a pickaxe or a bill a hook to reap or a scythe to mow a flail or what ye will the corn to thrash or the hedge to plash the market team to drive or mend the fence by the cover side and leave the game alive ay only give me work and then you need not fear that i shall snare his worship's hair or kill his graces dear break into his lordship's house to steal the plate so rich or leave the yeoman that had a purse to welter in a ditch wherever nature needs wherever labor calls no job i'll shirk of the hardest work to shun the workhouse walls where savage laws begrudge the pauper babe its breath and doom a wife to a widow's life before her partner's death my only claim is this with labor stiff and stark by lawful turn my living to earn between the light and dark my daily bread and nightly bed my bacon and drop of beer but all from the hand that holds the land and none from the overseer no parish money or loaf no pauper badges for me a son of the soil by right of toil entitled to my fee no alms i ask give me my task here are the arm the leg the strength the sinews of a man to work and not to beg still one of adam's heirs though doomed by chance of birth to dress so mean and to eat the lean instead of the fat of the earth to make such humble meals as honest labor can a bone and a crust with a grace to god and little thanks to man a spade a rake a hoe a pickaxe or a bill a hook to reap or a scythe to mow a flail or what ye will whatever the tool to ply here is a willing drudge with muscle and limb and woe to him who does their pay begrudge who every weekly score docks labor's little might bestows on the poor at the temple door but robbed them overnight the very shilling he hoped to save as health and morals fail shall visit me in the new bastille the spittle or the jail end of poem this recording is in the public domain